two speakers will uh, fit together beautifully. So looking forward to the panel discussion. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. I'm put this down here. That one as well. Oh my okay. gosh. Okay. Uh, thanks, Ariel, for the talk, and thanks, Anne, for the introduction. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation and the Buru Barongal people of the Darug Nation, who are the traditional owners of the lands of where UTS stands and where we meet. I'd also like to pay my respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to any other Aboriginal, Torres Strait Island or, or Indigenous person here today. Um, sovereignty was never ceded. This was and always will be Aboriginal land. También me gustaría convocar las energías de las abuelas y las ancestras para que estén con nosotros hoy día y que nos ayuden a conectarnos y superar las diferencias para escuchar con profundidad y respeto y lograr un, un cambio de dignidad. Um, okay. So the contribution that I'm making today, um, really, even though it speaks from a Colombian experience as an activist scholar, um, also is a way, or what I'd like to suggest, is a way that we might think about dialogues across the South between different communities here in Australia, here in the Hunter Valley, here in Newcastle, and there in the Valle de Cauca. And when I talk about the South, I don't mean it geographically. I mean it in terms of a relationship to power. So a kind of relationship in which one is excluded, dehumanized or exploited by hegemonic forms of power. And so the Southern can exist in the North geographically. And I kind of want to suggest that there is some sort of epistemic window of possibility that is opened up when we engage with those who confront and experience multiple oppressions and dehumanizations, so those of the feminized, racialized uh, majorities which crisscross this South. And that in doing so, we begin to make visible uh, power relationships uh, and the unthought um, which disrupt hegemonic understandings of both, I think, uh, mainstream and left uh, constructions of political subjectivity, political practices, and forms of emancipatory change. Um, and that speak, and already speaking, so I'm involved with some dialogues in the place that I sit in Newcastle, to the ways in which we might think together and co-create together and other politics of, that's decolonized and feminized and that reinvents revolutions with a small r, with multiplicity and an s at the end. Um, so, uh, I take us, shh, we're going to Colombia, uh, and we really situate this in terms of the both historic and the contemporary forms of intensification of disposability and precariousness of race and feminized subaltern communities. Uh, we come to a situation which has been characterized in the 20th century by a very uh, militarized form of state power where politics was an extension of war and war an extension of politics, which has then in the last 30 or so years been compounded by neoliberal restructuring. Um, and kind of there's been a, a, an alliance really, I guess, with the formal state elites, the neoliberal economic, both transnational and local elite, uh, elites with paramilitary forms of power and strong US intervention around uh, a supposedly drug strategy. Mm. Um, and with the kind of both historic but intensified in the neoliberal period are the similar tendencies that we see globally of how this particular accumulation strategy is characterized by an assault on popular power and women's and other subaltern communities, social and political power, and results in practices and strategies, some more obviously coercive and some much more about constructing consent to, to oppression and, and disartic, um, oppression and um, uh, subjugation through the disarticulation of popular political subjectivities and communities and institutions. And so the contemporary period is very, very much characterized by its anti-popular nature. Um, and in terms of political economy, by chains of transnational production, 
which are actually deeply feminized. So, for example, the export of flowers from Colombia is mostly the, the precarious labour there, and it's usually precarious contract with no rights, um, is feminised and racialised. Um, but also, which is characterised by fractures in the capacity to be included in these global kind of value chains. And so you have kind of historic race. Uh, gendered and classed exclusions and disposability combining with new particular territorial forms deeply feminized of precarity. Important though to I think really understand and which the movements that I work with in Colombia center is that these practices and processes and heritages of dehumanization are really marked by uh, a particular um, experience by raised and feminized subaltern communities, which is to exist really in the cracks of hypervisibility. So hypervisibility means that you're always subject to the gaze of suspicion. You're always assumed to be less than human or less than citizen, and therefore you're always legitimately subject to interventions upon your body and upon your community and upon your land to civilise, to develop, to rationalise, to um, uh, pacify. And then on the other side, invisibility. So invisibility as knowing subjects who have something to contribute to what we might call the dialogue or to, are not invited to the table which dialogues about what might be the solutions and the ways to think about a new kind of emancipatory politics that is both multiple um, and yet um, brings something common. Hmm? And so uh, this experience of being caught between hypervisibility and visibility uh, often as many, many uh, black theorists and feminists from the global south have talked about decolonial, you know, movements, often its most powerful implications are the internalization of these logics within the press subject themselves. So the idea that indeed we have nothing to offer, indeed we are underdeveloped, and indeed it is our problem that we're in poverty, for example, which of course is accentuated in the neoliberal context where everything's individualized, right, which was mentioned yesterday. So this is the broader context. And then we come down into the Valle de Cauca and we come to the, the two cities of Cali and Buenaventura in the Valle de Cauca, which is southwest. And we see this playing itself out in one, it being the site, one of, of, of used to be part of its territory of armed guerrillas who've recently um, been through a peace process and put down their arms and left territories and also a site of contested coca production for cocaine. So this whole big nexus of paramilitary state armed forces and the US government. Um, and we have supposedly a peace process, which is to ensure that there are peaceful democratic relationships. But the reality, which touches on something that Ariel talked about, is that what we have instead is an alliance between state, parastate, and multinational companies attempting to, dis, uh, to um, dispossess the land from ancestral communities, indigenous communities, but also from Afro-Colombian communities who make up a lot of the kind of joint communities in that region. And so what you have is this attempt to talk in the language of progress, modernity, peace and democracy and to implement monoculture of, of sugar plantations, for example, um, and to, uh, or, you know, international kind of tourist resorts and things like this in this region. Um, and in this context, we see what um, I and others have, have named uh, the feminization of resistance. Um, and in the case of this context, this really manifests itself through women and often mothers and grandmothers and the communities of which they're a part coming to the forefront in a tri-cultural coalition of Afro-Colombian mestiza, so mixed and indigenous women and their communities to both defend their sovereignty, so to defend their land and their right to that land, and to farm that land 
in ways which are very much connected to well-being and the reproduction of, of everyday life in ways that are sustainable, even though that's a term that is really problematic. So in ways that ensure well-being and then ways that in, uh, really contest and resist patterns of accumulation and dispossession. But also really important internal sovereignty. So to not only decolonize and reoccupy land as territory, but to decolonize and reoccupy self, subjectivity and social relationships as a homecoming, as a piecing back together of self. Because what the experience of these communities in struggle really helps us to see, if we don't already feel that and experience that, is that patriarchal capitalist coloniality deeply wounds and systematically traumatizes oppressed peoples and results in an inner fragmentation in which often the inner knowledges from the embodied or the spiritual or the emotional are negated and in which there are inner processes of exile. So Gloria Exile, um, Anne Saldua, who was a Chicana feminist, queer theorist and poet, talked about how we are forever in this context exiled from ourselves and each other. And so our processes are processes of homecoming understood in this, this multiple way. And the, the particular experience I want to just touch on to, to give some sense of this, what this involves. What's, what's this form of territory and self-determination which is both inner and outer? And what might it tell us about the ways in which we might rethink, reimagine and repractice an emancipatory regional local politics here and now? is called the Political School of New Butterflies Wings and it's based in, the, in Buena Ventura, which is on the coast in, the, by, uh, in this region um, and is surrounded by many, many ancestral lands and lands of Afro-Colombian communities. And it's basically run, self-organized by Afro-Colombian women and uh, indigenous women. And it is fascinating in the way that it centers violence but the way that it understands violence. So they understand the relationship, or they try to understand the relationship of the internal violences that often reproduce themselves in their traumatized communities in a way that doesn't reduce that to individual behavioral problems, doesn't excuse those, those behaviors, if there's internal gendered violence or, or intimate partner violence or, get, or violence between men, but it, what it does is it tries to situate that within the context of systematic violence done by state and capital to their communities, which results in these traumatic responses and post -tra complex post-trauma or, or trauma, systematic trauma often manifests itself in self-destructive patterns of behavior hmm? and the disintegration of those patterns of well-being um, and the reproduction of the politics of life. And so the way that they, they do this um, they do this in multiple ways, but things that I thought were really interesting to think about is that they do start from their stories. So they give um, a, a privilege and they centre what we might call in flesh knowledges or the knowledges of experience or the knowledges or, that come from connecting with those experiences of multiple traumas the knowledges of the body, ancestral knowledges of emotions, of oral storytelling. And they do this to then develop, I guess, methodologies and pedagogies of popular education so that the individual stories as we sit in circle are then situated together to pull out themes. So a little bit what um, Michael was doing yesterday, you know, the groups were repeating back and he was thematizing. These are the themes that are coming out. And then those themes are then put into dialogue with other knowledges. That might be the knowledges of other movements who are trying to make sense of similar experiences. That might be what are called academic texts, which are taken apart and engaged with. That might be um, uh, the knowledges of, of kind of ancestors who are invited to the space to also engage on a, on a more um, ancestral level with making sense of the experiences. And then this influences practice so the kinds of strategies that are developed by their community and their movements to defend their territory but also to construct inner sovereignty. Um, very important in this is the reconnection of the mind and the body 
so to embodied knowledges or what black feminists call the erotic. So the idea that we have a center of power that in the contemporary system, particularly as race and feminized communities, is cut off or ripped in half and that that actually removes us from our capacity to uh, allow the flow of our creative energies. Um, and so in the reconnection with embodied knowledges and the erotic, what is enabled is a clear articulation of our no's. What are the no's that we do not accept on our land, on our body, in our communities? But also a clear articulation of our yeses. What are the forms of life and the forms of relationship and the forms of cultivation and the forms of ceremony and the forms of knowing together that, that we want to uh, nourish and allow to flourish? As part of this is, is a... a Actually, can we show the little thing? There's, uh, there's just a tiny little, actually Michael, interestingly, came to Colombia. He was a student at work with me and then he came to Colombia with his partner and they videoed some of this stuff when I was there last year. So we just have a tiny little clip of uh, something that I'll talk to you about. short so you can hear there's kids there and it's feet so I thought it was actually really good to show the feet because the feet grounds us right into the present and, and connects with what I'm talking about their practices so in that there was a rich where was kind of the beginning of a, of a workshop in which the participants were asked to track and trace the story of what brought them there and they did this there was this kind of ritual in the center so a kind of altar in the center which represented the four um, elements and they'd called in the ancestors, as I did, to begin this space, both of here, this land, and also of the ancestors that accompany me to accompany us today. And then they had pieces of paper with pathways and footprints that you would have seen there. And the pieces of paper had different terms, right, that they were asked to, do they relate to their story and their journey of coming to that place? And what this foreground is the multiple forms of knowledge that are brought to play in the construction of our own stories and of narratives that make sense in a way that is liberatory for our capacity to transform conditions of oppression both inner and outer but also the role of ancestry and the spiritual so this kind of politics is deeply spiritual and deeply ancestral and calls upon and, and, and enacts a different understanding, not only of space, how do we organize a space of learning together? Hmm? What kinds of knowledges, what kinds of subjects and practices are in that space? But it's also something temporal in the sense that there is a very deep and clear embrace of what we might call as deep time. So the idea that this linear kind of productive focus, speed time that is so dominant in many ways in, in, this, in this context that we sit in, uh, in hegemonic you know, neoliberal capitalism, are disrupted through more circular understandings of time, when the ancestors are always present with us now, and where the future generations are also always present with us. And so the sense of who's the political subject expands to a kind of collective self, so in relation with, in this case, all the women who are in that space and the facilitators, but also to the ancestral subjects who are um, involved in the, in the coming to know and tell our own stories in liberatory ways. Um, deep time. Yeah, so, so there's something there that you know, disrupts again the normal dualisms of what constitutes knowledge and who are the subjects that know. I think there's also, and this, this speaks a lot to Ariel's talk as well, an, an ethics of care. And an ethics of care both in terms of the ways in which we organise our territories and our sovereignty, which centres a feminised politics of social reproduction. So, you know, the collective ways of coming to, to uh, farm our land, collective ways of managing and organising water, collective ways of thinking about housing, collective forms through which we think about education, right, and, and um, care. 
but also in terms of a feminized subjectivity. <clears throat> and when I use feminized here, I don't mean um, that this is, this is a, a characteristic to a property of particular sex bodies who have been socialized as men and women. I mean it as a particular centering of characteristics and practice which is otherwise in the history of modernity and a lot of leftist thought being relegated to invisibility or to um, uh, secondary importance in our political struggles for transformation. And these other kind of political, feminized political subjectivities really involve a different set of affectivities or effects. So vulnerability, tenderness, the acceptance of failure, um, as a point of learning and possibility, embrace of each other and discomfort um, as much as, and in fact, I would say, in opposition to often traditional forms of affect in political subjectivity, which are about mastery and control um, and, uh, I guess, um, dominance. Hmm. Uh, and so... As part of this, and again, speaking to, to what Ariel is, is talking about, so there are connections as well as slightly sometimes different focus, but, and, and, but there's these connections, is this that what they're co-constructing is really a politics of life as opposed to a politics of disposability and dehumanization. And that this really is premised upon the bringing to thought all that is racialized and feminized as characteristics, but as subjects, subjects of the land, of ancestry, and of raced and feminized subordinate communities. Um, and that this is, this is kind of necessarily multiple. It's not about so much transferring a model with a big M from one place to another place, as in saying, how might we open the conditions of possibility for us to dialogue with deep listening and with a, a capacity and an openness to reflect upon taken for granted assumptions about the nature of politics and social change that might well be outworn in this particular period that we're entering. Um, and which, I guess, suggest a reimagining of revolutionary practice. They're not a losing of revolutionary practice or not a losing of the idea of emancipation and self-liberation, but a focus on a multiplicity of forms that that might take and a focus on a very clear politics of knowledge, which is very disruptive for kind of academic forms of knowledge in the set or hierarchies of knowledge, because it very much is premised upon the idea that we're the ones we are waiting for, that we together collectively are philosophers, are thinkers, are creators, and can do this together. So there's much, it's very circular, circular models, actually. Um, now, of course, these... Um, if we think about this dialogically, and what does this suggest maybe is interesting or important to explore in the context where I sit in Newcastle most of the time, so I was in Colombia for six months last year, but I'm based most of the time in Newcastle, is I guess it, it, it for me suggests in my praxis and in the kinds of work I'm doing with Aboriginal and Indigenous peoples and, and, and subjects in precarity in the Newcastle space, is the focus on the possibilities of our learning and theorizing from the everyday and the role that kind of radical pedagogical processes might play in that. So radical processes of learning, unlearning, relearning, but also the way in which this can't remain in paradigms of where the cognitive is seen, the detached mastery of the cognitive is seen as the way in which we come to know in radical and revolutionary ways and in which we can learn together from already Aboriginal and decolonizing practices here of the knowledges that come from the embodied, from the spiritual, from the cultural. Um, I think it also kind of suggests the role of storytelling and of sitting in circle and practices of deep listening. And I mean deep epistemological listening that really develops these pedagogical practices that can unsettle the taken for granted or the unthought that can reproduce hierarchies and divisions and separations and blocks on our capacity to create the kinds of alternatives that we, we desire. Um, and to also centre as much outer sovereignty or autonomy or um, self-determination as inner practices of sovereignty and um, homecoming and connection 
and taking this seriously in the ways in which we reconstruct our subjectivities and our social relationships. And so these are some of the things that I'd like to offer and share as a way, both as experience, but as a way of thinking about what kind of everyday political praxis might be useful for us in the different places that we sit um, in light of the contemporary challenges and possibilities that we face um, in the 21st century. So, yeah.